Welcome everyone. I'm sorry for some apologies with our technical difficulties as always. Um, so we have here today uh, Chris Salwe, who is a psychiatrist, uh, who will be talking to us about psychedelics and psychosis, but I'll leave this to him to introduce himself a bit better. Hi, okay, yeah, my name is Chris Salwe. So I'm a consultant psychiatrist. That's sometimes, well, it's quite interesting actually, that's having this thought, because um, in some ways I'm quite proud of that, but actually it doesn't, it's not always received well. When you describe yourself as a psychiatrist, because that's what people have certain assumptions about you trying to analyze them. And I remember uh, parties being introduced to someone as a psychiatrist, someone had had a pretty difficult time in mental health services, and they were quite prickly. But by the end of the evening, we were hugging and getting on fine. So um, I, I've sort of stepped away. I've worked in clinical psychiatry for about 25 years and managed to step away from that recently, which is, which is really good. I mean, um, I perhaps had enough. People use the term burnt out. I don't really like the term burnout. now. That, was, that would suggest that uh, I'm not resilient enough or something, but actually if you're working in a system for a long time that sucks your soul, it just yeah, it takes its toll in the end. So, so I've been lucky enough to be able to mainly step away from that. So my current work is, yeah, so with work at the university, my, my main focus at the moment is I'm the principal investigator on several psychedelic studies that we're going to be doing at Royal Devon Exeter Hospital. I also work for a medical cannabis company. I still do a little bit of clinical work. I do some out-of-hours cover for a secure hospital in Wellington, Somerset. Um, and I also work we're involved with a group called Compassionate Mental Health Care. Now, that's a, they meet twice a year in Wales, South Wales. They've been running for about seven years, and it's come together with people working in mental health service, people with lived experience of mental health problems, carers, family members, and it's a... So non-hierarchical, they're all coming together, sort of looking at different models for trying to help some people in mental distress. I mean, the, the ideal would be some sort of residential, uh, non-hospital, crisis house, non-hospital setting for people. Uh, but that's not actually happening yet. But anyway, so I'm involved with that. Um, so I'd say my talk today is about the relationship between psychedelics and psychosis. Now, I'm not, an, 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 I'm not an academic, as I say, I've worked in, in medicine for about 30 years in psychiatry for like 25 years. So it's drawing a lot on my own experiences and thoughts. Um, and what I'm going to talk about, break down the talk today, I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about my career in, in medicine, my personal career. Um, not because I'm a narcissist, I don't, but more, I think it actually informs how I've come to my opinions, if I describe that. Um, and then I'm talking a little briefly about the um, history of psychiatry and how biological psychiatry has become the sort of dominant voice. And then I'll talk about what psychosis, talk about dis discuss psychosis, what that may be, what it means to people, and then talk about the relationship between psychedelics and psychosis. So I qualified from a medicine from Leicester University Medical School in 1989. Um, and I sort of did my house, you do your pre-registration year, but I was quite disillusioned with medicine and not life in general, but sort of conventional life. And I was looking for something alternative. So I, I bought myself a, an old British telecom truck and joined the nefarious ranks of the New Age Travellers. Mm -hmm. And um, that was sort of caught the tail end of the free festival scenes. Although at that point, there was, it was getting a bit messy. There was a lot of drunkenness and thieving. And um, then me and my girlfriend, we moved to, to Ireland uh, to West Cork, uh, to sort of a sort of hippie alternative community called Cork Mountain. It was called Cork Mountain before the hippies got there. And um, so anyway, I did that for a while. Um, and I was sort of exploring sort of health medicine and different approaches to medicine rather than allopathy, because allopathy, sort of orthodox medicine, allopathy is very disease orientated. Um, Whereas other approaches are more sort of helping the organism get whole. And actually psychedelics, you could think of as that, rather than disease orientated, it is about trying to make the person whole and well. Um, so when I came back to medicine, I thought, yeah, allopathy is best is in emergency. So I worked in emergency medicine for a year in London, realized I wasn't really cut out for that. So I moved down to Somerset and trained to general, become a GP and worked as a GP for a little while. But um, I realised that my true calling was psychiatry. When I was doing general practice, my clinic was always running late because I'd been chatting to people for a long time. And, um, and actually, I really enjoyed psychiatry as an undergraduate. 
Um, in fact, you know, I looked at it, though I was like, at that time, I was reading a lot of Ardy Lang and re arguing with the tutors, so I failed my undergraduate psychiatry first time round, and I had to, had to resit it after my finals. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so coming back to, so working as a, you know, as a junior doctor in psychiatry doing my training, I would just spend a lot of time hanging out on the wards, really, just sort of um, get alongside people, like, beating up old leather jacket and, and long hair at that point, and would often get mistaken for one of the patients, which was, I was quite proud of, really. And um, you could smoke on the ward in those days as well. So I used to sort of joke that my work involved sitting around, drinking tea, smoking, chatting to mad people, which wasn't vastly different from my leisure time activities either. <laughs> so, so coming back to, it's interesting, as I said, I sort of came into sort of psych, psychiatry with a sort of different, different sort of view of it. But having working in that, 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 that world for a while, I began to actually sort of believe the medical, in the training I was doing, and what I was seeing, I began beginning to believe the medical model. Because you'd see people with a sort of diagnosis of schizophrenia who'd been off their medications and become unwell, and they come back in, back on medications. Um, I mean, now I see that as what's happening there is a is a sort of a rebound psychosis when someone suddenly stops their medication. But I began to sort of uh, believe that model. I think sort of the, the, the way I see it sometimes, actually, what's happened in psychiatry is that after decades of using antipsychotics and using antidepressants, we're actually changing the, the natural histories of psychosis and depression. So, so coming back to my story, as I say, I completed my membership for Royal College of Psychiatry, became a consultant, worked generally you know, with people with major mental illness, with psychosis, worked on intense psychiatric intensive care unit for a long time, worked for the early intervention team of psychosis in Somerset, and worked to quite recently in um, forensic settings. So that's people who have uh, committed an offence when they're psychotic and then get a hospital order from the courts. Um, so yeah, so I was working in this, <laughs> as I said, I sort of adopted the medical model, then working in that for a while, and just beginning what a nonsense it is, you know, because you're seeing people come along with all this trauma and it's very understandable why they're depressed to then talk about some sort of chemical imbalance is, is a bit meaningless. And I was lucky in, in 2016, our trust paid for us to do some training in a model called Open Dialogue, which the model comes from West Lapland. Now that is um, roots of that sort of family, ther family therapy. So it's a systemic model. So it's rather than, um, so what you're seeing is that there's, there's, there's some problem in the family or in the social network, and that difficulty will come out in, the, in a sensitive individual in that group presenting with problems. Um, and then once you sort of, then if you then label them and diagnose them with a disorder, then actually that's all the focus on them. You're not really addressing the, the whole issue. So yeah, so that's, that's a lovely model. Um, yeah, I could talk more about that, but maybe I'll talk about that a bit more. So moving on, um, it's a very potted history of psychiatry, but if we go, the father of psychiatry is sometimes called Philip Pinel, who lived at the end of the 18th century, was a French physician. Um, I say sometimes the father of psychiatry. So around that time, at the end of the 18th century, the insane were seen as sort of wild animals who'd lost all reason and treated in appalling conditions and sort of shackled in, in madhouses. Um, have we moved on? Sometimes people are a bit shackled with chem chemicals nowadays, aren't they? And some support accommodation is, isn't great either. But, um, so anyway, so Pinel with others, it's a time, it's the age of enlightenment, and Pinel, there's a sort of movement to sort of looking at people with insanity in a more humane, more compassionate way. Uh, there's a famous painting in 1795 with um, Pinel ordering the, the shackles to be removed from the, from the women in the uh, in, from the um, hospital in Madhouse in Paris. So, and there was the York Retreat, which was sort of Quaker movement, um, and there was the sort of early asylums. And I think the early the early asylums were were a force for good. I think you know there was sort of uh, nice surroundings, um, there was some compassionate, humane approaches to help support people, um, and things were. And you know, mental health, you know, insanity was looked at sort of psychologically and socially, not necessarily so bio biologically. 
But I think that sort of those asylums sort of lost their way through the, the 19th century. That whole system became quite abused, overcrowded, and people being put there because of their views, particularly women, if they were having strong opinions or pregnant out of wedlock and these sort of things. Um, so the rest of the 19th century, and then towards the end of the 19th century, there was um, tertiary syphilis was discovered. So there's something called tertiary syphilis can cause something called general paralysis of the insane. And when that was identified, it was probably a third, up to a third of, of people in asylums actually had uh, tertiary syphilis. So that was, there's a very clear biological reason for insanity there, isn't there? So that was something in the, in the sort of in the corner of supporting that idea. But then also we had the birth of psychoanalysis at the end of the 19th century with, with Freud and Jung. And that sort of influenced a lot of psychiatry thinking, I think in the particularly in the early sort of 20th century. Um, but then after World War II, there was a sort of, yeah. And even after World War II, you, you, when you started to get sort of more biologically minded psychiatrists, you still had psych well, you still had psychodynamically minded psychiatrists, you had social psychiatrists, but I say since World War II onwards, that sort of biological psychiatry has become the much more dominant voice. Um, I think the psychiatry was trying to see itself as a as, as a science, as a field of medicine, and the sort of thinking about like sort of diabetes being an abnormality of the pancreas not producing enough insulin, so sort of the idea of sort of think of the brain in that way, so the sort of chemical imbalances of the brain. The, the advent of random, randomized controls trials didn't help either, because trying to fit psychiatry into randomized controlled trials, then you had to start putting these you know lumping these disorders together from. But there was no, yeah, there wasn't necessarily should be lumped together. Um, sorry, where was I? Yeah, so, so this idea of a sort of chemical imbalance, depression caused by too little serotonin, psychosis caused by too much dopamine. It's far too simple, isn't it? I mean, it's it's ludicrously simple, but that's sort of been carrying on and on that that way of thinking. Um, Joanna Moncrief, uh, psychiatrist in London has written a book called uh, The Myth of the Chemical Cure. She, she recently published a big sy systematic review and there's really, you know, um, no evidence for a serotonin abnormality in depression. Um, maybe after you've been on SSRI for a while, but no, not before. The, um, and then there's the, the whole dopamine hypothesis of psychosis. So 1952, the chlorpromazine was first discovered. That was the first um, antipsychotic drug and that was known to block dopamine. And around that time, there was people sort of using amphetamines and developing a paranoid psychosis. And it was known that amphetamines caused a sort of dopamine release. So there was this sort of whole theory about psychosis being caused by too much dopamine. And that's been the mainstay of sort of the treatment of psychosis ever since, really. You get a new antipsychotic on the market, but it's still a dopamine blockade. It might be just slightly more specific or whatever. Um, uh, sorry, this is a big shack. Yeah. Um, yeah, and actually, it's very simplistic. So, there may be in a certain area of the brain, the mesolimbic area of the brain, some raised dopamine activity in psychosis, but that's the symptom, not the cause, if you see what I mean. As in, there's some stress, some traumas, maybe some drugs, and that causes this raised dopamine rather than it being this person's brain just produces too much dopamine. Some people may be more sensitive, I suppose to that happening at times of stress. So currently in the UK, we've got 15% of the adult population on psych, 15% of the adult population on psychiatric drugs, 20% in America. Um, and is, that's clearly not working, is it? I mean, as, if that was any other condition, heart disease or cancer, you'd be thinking, what are you doing? Because it's huge numbers and we're not seeing depression going down. Suicide rates go up um, in line with antidepressant prescribing. Um, so we've got this ridiculous situation now where anti-anxiety drugs cause anxiety, antidepressants cause depression, and antipsychotics cause psychosis. But I mean, there are some caveats on that. In that, um, it's short-term use of some of those drugs may be useful, okay? Um, and in severe depression, antidepressants may be useful, and as a antipsychotics use short-term may have some benefits. But Professor Gurch, who's one of the co-founders of Cochrane, has anyone had, no, heard of Cochrane? It's a, it's a Scandinavian organization, not pharmaceutically funded. The idea is to look objectively at evidence. And Prof, Prof. Gerch, co founder of Cochrane, he just says overall psychiatric drugs are doing more harm than good. 
So how did we get here? Um, is it just the pharmaceutical industry's fault? Well, it's, it's a mixture. There was all, the, the pharmaceutical industry, the, the DSM-5, the classification system, um, the American Psychiatric Association, the medical insurance companies, the regulators, it all feeds in together, actually. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, and I'm not the only person saying this. There's lots of critical, there's a movement called the Critical Psychiatry Network, a lot of psychiatrists in that who are saying this sort of thing. Um, Robert Whitaker's a good guy to, to look up, wrote Mad in America, Anatomy of an Epidemic. Um, and actually, colleagues I work with who have been around the block for a while, psychiatrists have been in the circuit system, they don't have great faith in these medications. You sort of mean the system we've ended up in. You end up, um, I mean, I don't, you end up in a system, you see people and there isn't much to offer them and you end up prescribing, even though you don't really believe in the drugs you're prescribing. So, we move now on to what is, what is psychosis? Well, I've been working in this field for over 25 years. I'm not entirely clear, I'd say. But um, I say it's a broad term. There's different causes and different phenomenology and different outcomes, rather than say that it's one thing. Um, sorry, yeah. And the other thing is I don't see it as this other, this sort of thing that you have non-psychotic people, psychotic people. It's all part of a spectrum. And anyone pushed far enough to become psychotic. Um, Maybe some people are a bit more sensitive than others, but anyone push far enough. Um, but if we look at, so if we think about, say, try and come back to a definition of, of psychosis then. I mean, the etymology, psyche, mind, spirit, soul, and um, osis is, is Latin for abnormal condition of. So psychosis actually just means abnormal <laughs> condition of the mind, really. So it's very broad. But um, what really you mean when you're using the term psychosis is someone who's lost touch with reality. Um, somebody lost touch with having unusual beliefs, with delusions, experiencing unusual phenomenon, unusual phenomenology. Often, there's a sort of can be a loss of loss of the sense of self. You get thoughts inserted, thought broadcasting, ideas of being controlled. Um, and some, yes, yeah, some other ways of putting it though. It's nice. Well, there's R.D. Lang. You probably heard of. Sort of um, R.D. Lang just said that insanity is the same response to an insane world. It's quite a simple thing. Peter Breggin, an American psychiatrist, who must be in his 80s now, sometimes talks about as the, the conscience of American psychiatry. I love, his, I love what he said. Psychosis is like broken poetry, the flagging the soul's attempt to make sense of its reality. Um, while we're talking about that, I just want to talk, people do often ask, what's the difference between psychosis and schizophrenia? So we'll talk a bit, I mean, schizophrenia, I don't actually believe in schizophrenia anymore. Um, Schizophrenia would be seen, I guess, as someone who has a uh, recurrent psychotic episodes or ongoing long-term psychosis. So that would be called schizophrenia. And the idea is there is, you know, it's it's 80, 90, I was taught it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, 89, 80 to 90% inherited, okay? But when you drill down that, they haven't found any. There's been some suggestions of different things going on in the brain, but we haven't found any firm evidence biologically for schizophrenia. When you look at that, that evidence for it being inherit, inherited, that's very flawed. Early on, you can look at, there's, you know, you can look at the families, and there's people with psychosis in families, but that's a huge environmental effect if you've got family members with psychosis. And there's sort of adoption studies and twin studies going back to the 50s and 60s. When you drill down and look at those now, they're very flawed. And actually, there's the Human Genome Project that spent 8.8 .8 billion pounds looking for genetic causes of schizophrenia and haven't found it. Okay, so um, I tend not to use that word very much. It's so pejorative. Some people I know identify. I know a friend, someone I know, they, 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 they find that, that that label helpful. So that's okay. Um, so if we talk about psychosis, I'd rather, this isn't, I'm going to try and break psychosis down a bit into some types, but this isn't absolute. As I said before, it's a broad thing and things are very different for different people. Sorry. Uh, so firstly, there is a group of psychosis that would be described as an organic psychosis. So an organic psychosis means there's something going on in the brain that you can identify. So that may be someone with dementia, 
uh, or after a stroke, they may develop some psychotic symptoms. A drug, in, a drug intoxicated state, that would count as an organic psychosis, or a drug withdrawal state, and it's something called alcoholic, alcoholic hallucinosis. And then you have an acute transient psychosis. Um, so that would be someone who's going along, they have some big stressful life events, and it precipitates um, a, psych a psychosis. Um, which generally has a good prognosis, that sort of functioning well, big stressful life event, precipitate a psychosis, and um, yeah, and that, that would generally have a good prognosis if it's allowed to sort of carry on through that. I mean, sometimes medications may be needed if things are getting quite dangerous, but I do worry, I, I can think of like in my career, as I talked about that time spending hours talking to people, a couple of people, you sort of drill down and you think, well, actually, it was more like an acute transient psychotic episode they were having, and they've been medicated very early on in that, and maybe created this, and kept on medication, this more chronic illness. I mean, I was always taught, actually, I mean, sort of, if someone gets presented with psychosis, that you leave them for at least a week before you, you give medication, maybe give some to help sleep, but actually, you don't see that happening. You see people medicated very soon. Um, a lot of spiritual emergence, spiritual emergencies would probably fit into that category of an acute transient psychosis. And often people find it a healing process, whether you call it a spiritual emergence or not, people will find it a healing process. Um, and then you have something which is called something with a slow prodrome slowly coming on, which is a worse prognosis. So that would be someone who they just turns into uh, develop sort of withdrawal, lots of interest in things, isolating themselves, and then sort of slowly developing some, some voices or paranoia. Um, so that sort of slow program is felt to be sort of, you know, poor prognostic factor. Um, although some of the interesting readings recently, sort of, you know, sometimes that sort of call to shamanism would be someone goes into that period of withdrawal for several years before they sort of find, find, their, find their calling. Um, then you have a late onset psychosis. So someone in their 40s or 50s, um, Sometimes they're quite understandable. They're quite socially isolated and they might have had a falling out with their neighbor and then they start imagining their neighbors talking about them and through the walls and things build up. Um, Isaac Newton apparently developed a psychosis in his 50s, paranoia in his 50s. Um, then last we have what's called affective psychosis. So affect is to do with mood. So you can get a main elevated mood, mainly you can get psychosis associated with that and you can get a psychotic depression as well. So I mentioned, yeah, the term spiritual emergence. So it was Christina Goff, Stanislav Groff developed that term, that, 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 that idea of a, a spiritual emergence or spiritual emergency. So spiritual emergence, so the spiritual side is emerging and it can present as an emergency. Um, that's okay. I mean, I for a lot of people, it doesn't, that doesn't hold, you know, people I can think of women we worked with who went through a sort of, Transit psychotic episode, she found it very healing and transformative, but you use that term and she didn't really like that. That didn't really resonate for her. So it's a transformation, quite like just the term a healing crisis, really. Um, reminded by the Joseph Campbell quote, which I'm sure you've all heard as well, which is the, the psychotic drowns in the same waters that the mystic swims. Now, I really like that. And if you drill back, come back to so it's in the same waters, but they're not a mystic. Does that make you in that realm? People say they're in that realm. And also, I think break that a bit further down because it's like is someone falling accidentally? Um, were they pushed? I know someone who was spiked with datura. So, but yeah, and uh, or did they intentionally jump? They shed load of psychedelics. Did they intentionally jump in there? And um, I'm minded by another quote, Bob Marley: "Don't jump in the waters if you can't swim." The um, so when I worked with the early intervention team in psychosis in Somerset, now that's a national thing, the early intervention teams for psychosis, so that the idea is to put some, someone presents with the person to have sort of uh, dedicated, you know, it's a small, so you have a smaller caseload and do more intensive work, and there is family work that goes on and psychological work, but the mainstay is this belief that actually you need to medicate people soon. But I was quite fortunate in the team I was working with in Somerset that, um, we, yeah, yeah, we were quite psychotic in mind. We've done the open dialogue training, and so we'd often, you know, do a lot of training work. And 
my friend Chris Sheldrake, who's Rupert's nephew and, and lives in Glastonbury, so he's quite alternative-minded as well. But I remember sitting chatting one day saying, I'd love to see spiritual emergence. It just you, you don't see, it didn't equate with what we were seeing. We we're just seeing trauma, trauma, trauma all the time, causing people's psychosis. I can think of a couple of clear cases, perhaps in my career. And one case I'll just tell you the details of, because I think it's quite a sad case, really. As I said, looking back, it was when I sort of first started as a junior doctor in psychiatry, and I was really young and enthusiastic. And uh, there was this guy there who was really young, he was an anthropology student, lovely guy. And um, looking back on it now, he'd had a Kundalini experience. Um, he was studying anthropology, he was getting into Buddhism, doing a lot of meditation. And he described sort of the energy rising through him, everything going purple, in fact, quite ecstatic, and ran down the street naked, uh, got detained on the Mental Health Act, came into hospital, and was very heavily medicated with antipsychotic medication. And I found it really sad because over the last 25 years, our paths have kept on crossing in this guy. And uh, I've progressed through my life, and he's just got progressively worse. It's very sad. And um, um, and now we now would have a diagnosis of treatment-resistant schizophrenia, which is a term I hate. I hate the term treatment-resistant depression as well. These terms suggest that there's something wrong with the person rather than the treatment we're giving. In fact, the treatment we're giving may be causing that problem. Um, so, yeah, that brings me on to a bit more about about psychiatric treatments. I talked about the idea of this raised dopamine levels in the brain. So, so the idea is you block the dopamine. So if you block dopamine for a while, what the body reacts by increasing the amount of dopamine receptors. Okay, that makes sense? You've got the dopamine's trying to get through, and it's being blocked, so the body reacts. It needs more, it needs more dopamine, so the receptors are going up. Um, and then if you take away that blockade, if you stop the antipsychotic, you've got this hypersensitive dopamine system, so you get a rebound psychosis. Mm -hmm. So the evidence is so flawed when you look at it. I mean, there's evidence for, like, maintenance use of, anti of antipsychotics. Is you take a group of people who have been on antipsychotics for two years, half of them stay on antipsychotics and half go placebo, and you see a big relapse in the, in the placebo arm. Um, I don't doubt that antipsychotics dampen down symptoms in the short term, okay? Um, but the idea is if you let the psychosis run, if you let it run, you can actually you're working through that, you're healing through that. Whereas if you block, by using medication, you're blocking that process, okay? They may have some place at times, you know, especially if someone's very dangerous, someone just needs bringing down, you know, if they're very manic, you know, bringing down, they have its place, but it should be tailed off. Um, Coming back to Robert Whittaker again, so he's like reviewed like 50 years of antipsychotic use, and actually th there was better outcomes in the pre-antipsychotic era. And I don't like the term antipsychotic because it suggests it's this magic bullet, really. Heroin's a better antipsychotic. I've known people that sort of, that's, the, that's the only thing that stops their paranoid voices. So, but yeah, call it a neuroleptic, seizes the neuron. That's his proper name, but yeah. So 50 years of neuroleptics, we're not seeing better outcomes. There were better outcomes before. Um, the World Health Organization did two studies in the 60s and 70s, which were longitudinal studies with eight different sites across the world. And they've seen better outcomes of psychosis in the so-called developing world compared to the, the first world. So 64% recovery, something like 18%. Um, then there was the Soteria Project, Lauren Mostra, a psychiatrist, and that was he was an expert in schizophrenia in the 70s. It was a hospital without medication, with compassion and support. They were getting much better outcomes. He was shut down. He resigned from the American Psychiatry Association. So it should be called the American Psychopharmacology Association. The um, open dialogue in West Lapland, again, seeing very good results with first episode psychosis. I mean, they're very small studies. They're not randomized. Okay, but yeah, um, they suggest better outcomes. Uh, the final thing to say, there's a, there's a lot of talk about trying to differentiate between spiritual emergence and um, psychosis, okay? Stanford Croft talks about this. So, it's, it's so make sure you can spot that to support that rather than if it's psychosis, you need to treat it with medication. And actually, part of me thinks actually you don't actually need to worry about trying to differentiate between the two because the treatment should be the same. The treatment should be just 
compassion support and helping that process um uh, you know unravel not work yeah process uh, that process through so I've been talking quite a while and I haven't got on to the topic which is <laughs> psychedelics and psychosis so I think it's relevant though well <laughs> to this so if you talk about psychedelics and psychosis the split there into two there's basically the, the, the psychotomimetic so as mimicking psychosis and the psychotogenic causing psychosis. So I'll talk a bit first about the psychotomimetic, uh, the sort of model for psychosis. And that was the way psychedelics were first being thought about in the early part of the 20th century. Dimescalin was discovered in the, in the, in the 19th century and uh, first synthesized in, in 1919. So, um, yeah, so it was being used, um, seemed to be yeah, a model for psychosis. Stockings in 1940 said mescaline causes a medley of all the known psychotic symptoms occurring at random. And as I was saying before, in the early 20th century, psychiatry was very dominated by the sort of psychoanalytical way of thinking. So it was trying to get into that world. So psychedelics could be used to try and understand the world of their, of their patients. Um, to understand the psychotic world full of its richness, its, with its pain and its ecstasy. Um, yeah, and also giving some empathy for the people you're working with. In fact, Humphrey Osmond, who I'm sure you've heard of, he coined the phrase psychedelic, he, he suggested that all psychiatrists in training should do a psychedelic. Um, Humphrey Osmond went further about this whole idea with mescaline. He believed that actually what was happening in psychosis was the brain was producing a mescaline-type substance, which he called substance M, which was um, not found, obviously. But anyway, so there was... There was a move away from this anyway, sort of the, this idea about, as a model, I mean, 50s, 60s, um, there was beginning to kick back against, in the psychiatric community, against the use of psychedelics anyway. And, uh, and as I said before, there was, well, was discovered in 1952, and this switched to more sort of biological psychiatry. So switching from sort of this idea of actually being with your patients and trying to understand their world to actually them othering them, if you see what I mean, and observing. So you're sort of just describing the symptoms, trying to treat this brain disorder, okay? So, so there's a move away from the psychomimetic, but I still think it's valid. I still think it's useful. There's clearly differences. Uh, people who have psychosis have done psychedelics will say there's big differences. Obviously, there's the sort of idea that you, in psychosis, you're, uh, you haven't got, uh, what's the word? Sorry, you haven't got control over the process, you're being controlled. Um, you, you, you know, it's, but anyway, but there's certainly some similarities. And I do think it's still helpful for un empathy and understanding. People uh, who take a psychedelic and have that, I don't like that term, but yes, yeah, so called bad trip will often describe coming back and sort of feeling glad to be sane and feeling they were going crazy and how awful that was. Um, so, psychotogenic. As in causing psychosis. Does it cause psychosis? Well, there's a big population study with the Krebs et al. 2000 and when was that, 2013? There's 130,000 people, that sort of survey in America, looking at lifetime use of psychedelics and mental health condition. And there was like no association. If anything, there was a suggestion that people with lifetime use of psychedelics had better mental health. So is that it? Is that the end of the end of the question about whether it's psychotogenic or not. If you ask most people, not necessarily in this room, but if you ask a lot of people, psychedelics is it makes you go crazy, doesn't it? God. And it, there's, there is the hangover from the war on drugs and the sort of stuff about that. But actually it's not just that. Or people will say about Sid Barrett, you know, or, or sort of they've got a friend, they did LSD and they were never the same again. So, you know, people certainly have that concern. And when I spoke at the Compassionate Mental Health Gathering last November, I spoke about psychedelics, and a lot of people there had lived experience of, of psychosis, and they were very scared about the idea of, of psychedelics. And there was, there was a woman there who, she had two protracted periods of psychosis, taking LSD, um, and ended up in hospital. And um, although <laughs> she wouldn't regret it, though, a lot of people I know who have had psychosis have had this awful time, but it's been a really rich, powerful time as well. Um, and, and, and psychedelic researchers are clearly very worried about this as well, because it's, it's, it was, it's an absolute contraindication, a, a personal or family history of psychosis. 
So they certainly can precipitate some sort of brief difficulty, you know, a brief, often, you know, might be a day or two, but sometimes more so. Sometimes it can be longer than that, I suppose. And um, often that can be in the, yeah, in the recreational setting. And that can, if it drills down to sort of the, you know, the importance, we talk about the importance of set, setting, and also dosage as well, because you don't know what necessarily you're getting and what dosage you're taking. Um, and I see sort of, I can see it a few different ways of thinking about how, how it can cause some ongoing psychotic symptoms. I think in that wrong set and setting, and if you're some unresolved trauma, because psychedelics are very good at helping people work through unresolved traumas. So when you're in this like not great set and setting, and you have like a powerful psychedelic experience, and this stuff comes up for you, and you're not able to sort of process it and work through it, can cause problems. When again, when I was working in the early intervention team in psychosis with Chris, we, we saw this guy who'd taken some mushrooms, he was having a great time, and then it all went dark and sinister, and then he was left afterwards with this sort of like paranoia, um, so sort of withdrew to his room, didn't want to go out about it, everyone was looking at him and talking about him, and we didn't medicate him. We just had lots of open dialogue meetings with him and his mum, and we talked, and it took a while, but after, in the end it came out, in the end it came out, there was this sort of thing that he'd done when he was 15 that he felt very bad about, really. I mean, it wasn't awful, it wasn't great, it wasn't awful, but yeah, you didn't have to call the police. But anyway, this was, this, this had really come up when he was like on the, on the mushrooms, and, um, and yeah, so, we had to talk through that, and, and it was okay. Um, yeah, you just think about, another well, joke is like sort of, yeah, so repeated doses, people doing repeated doses without integration. Uh, psychonauts go psychonuts, is the one, but yeah. The, um, I sometimes think the new device just punches you on the nose in the end, like sort of, if you keep on pushing it. Um, and then I do think about this idea, I said, I don't like the idea of schizophrenia, but I do think about this, there are some sensitive creative souls who are quite near that, that boundary, if you like. And the psychedelics too much for them sometimes. Um, I was like, um, remember Bruce Parry's book, The Tribe, when he does that, he really goes to the, was it the Sonoma tribe and they do Sakona, it's a DMT snuff and it's a sort of man initiation and they all do this. And there's the guy, Paulino, who describes as a, a gentle, sweet man. The night before the initiation, the spirits come to him in his dreams and tell him not to take Sakona. And he tells the, the elders that the next day, and they obviously respect that, and, and he doesn't. Um, I can think of a friend of mine who, this wasn't a bad set and set, there was a lovely festival in Wales, and I call her Mary. It's not a real name, but I call her Mary. Um, and when I heard this, I wasn't there, I heard the story. I and mean, my first thought was Mary Acid. It was just like, she was a woman, a lovely woman, but she was quite out there. The thought of her taking acid. And she took some acid on the Sunday and it was just, you know, it was, it was good because they were crew at this festival. It was a lovely setting and they were all crew and like the festival had finished. So it was everyone, it was a safe place and she was able to run around naked and just went off for several days. But she was able to run through that, which is quite, you know, and, and actually got a twin sister to come down from what island, but yeah, they worked through it, but yeah, so I just, as I said, it was just, my thought of her taking acid was like, anyway. <laughs> um, so, where are we going? Yeah, and coming back to, and if that does happen, it comes back to what I was talking about before, an acute transient psychotic episode. And people take acute transients, if that's managed badly, if that is treated with medication, if you see what I mean, then you can make a more chronic illness. So I don't think so I don't think psychedelics can cause a chronic illness if managed right, if you see what I mean. But again, talking about in my time when I worked as a junior doctor in psychiatry it's been a long time, there was there was a couple of cases of people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And when you drill down, there was like they'd done a mushroom. There was this one guy in particular, he'd done like a lot of mushrooms. It was only like, you know, that thing, and he'd done some mushrooms one day. Well, that's fun. I'll do like a load more. When he was like 18, with his mum and dad at home, and like sort of had this awful time. There was this big thing in the news at the time about this girl that'd been missing. And he was convinced his dad had killed her and just buried under the patio. So he had like sort of was holding his dad at hostage point and he got dragged off into hospital and, and medicated. And so, yeah, it was like, what am I trying to say? Yeah, I think so. If you can, 
if you have it, they can precipitate an acute transit psychosis, and if that is managed wrong, then perhaps it can cause a, a chronic problem, a long term problem. Mm -hmm. So, how about in the clinical setting? Well, back in the early 50s, 60s, there was like thousands of LSD studies done. Um, Sidney Cohen, um, in 1960, a psychiatrist, he sort of looked to try and pull that together. And so he looked at there was 5,000 cases, 25,000 doses of LSD or mescaline. And he came up with a figure of 0.8 per 1,000 episodes of psychosis in the outpatient population, 1.8 per 1,000 in the inpatient population. And there's 0.4 per thousand suicide. And uh, this was reported as LSD sort of being quite safe. Sidney Cohen's quite interesting because actually then he began to doubt that Sidney Cohen being an advocate for LSD, then actually began to worry about it and felt that um, he was hearing these bad. He was thinking there was cases being hushed up basically. Not everyone came back with information. So he was um, worried that that it may have been worse than that those results particularly showed. Um, but what's happening? Now then, in current psychedelic research, I'm not particularly aware of, uh, of things happening. You know, whether that's happened again, people don't want to publicize them if they do happen. Um, I mentioned the Spiritual Crisis Network. When I was at a meeting with them, I can't really go into much detail. It's a closed meeting, what people share. But to say, they are seeing people, who, you know, with ongoing difficulties at the Spiritual Crisis Network after use of psychedelics, including in clinical trials. And... Um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, and also, I mean, also, let's see, after people are going through some yoga retreat as well, that can happen. But yeah, so I think we need to be mindful of it. What I sort of worry about a bit is the idea that uh, a lot of the studies, there's like two or three integration sessions afterwards, which may be fine for, for every, most, most people, but there may be a minority of people where actually they get a, a protracted healing crisis, if you like. It's like sort of, someone's say, oh, you know, if someone gets psychosis after, after psychedelic, it's a disaster. I don't think it's a disaster. Do you see what I mean? It's a healing crisis. And it's just been, you know, so it maybe needs a bit longer support um, than, than, we, than we have. Um, the other thing would be, the other thing we'll talk about lastly is how about people with psychosis? Because they're contraindicated at the moment, aren't they? Um, I don't think that she, there was. I don't know if anyone saw Haley Durer in a breaking convention. She the, she presented a couple of a, a longitudinal and a uh, cross sectional survey. Quite small numbers, but these are people with psychosis using psychedelics. And yeah, basically in the, in the history of the psychosis group, there was actually a reduction in in symptoms after use of psychedelics. Although in people with a history of mania, there was some increase of symptoms. And that I found a paper that was just published last month by Ludwig and Honk et al. And again, it's quite small numbers. Um, 100 psychedelic users, 33 with a history of uh, psychosis. And similar stuff, actually, in that um, less psychotic symptoms in people with a history of psychosis, but some increased symptoms in mania. Um, it's interesting about mania. So John Anderson, he's a cognitive neuroscientist, and I saw him speak um, at the Institute of Psychotherapy Therapy a couple of weeks ago. Now he's got di a diagnosis of bipolar, what's called rapid cycling. So he was having several episodes of mania depression every year, and he treated himself with psilocybin and basically feels it's cured his it cured his bipolar. Um, that's a case of one, obviously. And I just think um, I can remember when I was working in. Um, inpatient ward in, in Somerset, we had this guy, he was quite unwell at the time, it was quite crazy at the time, and he went AWOL, went to Glastonbury Festival, did some acid, and um, was finding it quite intense, so he just took himself to the medical tent and said, oh, I'm section three of Wyden, take me back there, please. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, they actually had to afterwards, he was actually better, but yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so to conclude, I think, um, well, yeah, I think that there's this perceived risk of, of psychosis with psychedelics is, yeah, it's still there, isn't it? I think, you know, I think it's overstated. I do think we need to be aware of its potential, and I think you just need to have the sort of right support in place, maybe longer term. I don't, 
I haven't mentioned this, one, one people, what I worry about is that sort of there's this idea, this myth called latent schizophrenia or something. So, mm -hmm. so someone will take some acid and they get a protracted psychotic episode and it's actually, oh, well, it was going to happen sooner or later. It was nothing to do with us. Um, go away and get to your treatment. But yeah, so, but um, no, I think to be prepared, I think people with a history of psychosis, it shouldn't be an absolute contraindication, you know, especially because seeing people who've had a psychotic, you know, a stressful life event, brief psychotic episode, and done shed loads of psychedelics afterwards and been fine. So, or people with psychosis, active psychosis. I mean, there's very struck. Uh, sometimes there's, it's, you know, there's a lot of trauma. And people are very stuck, and actually, I think it'd be really helpful. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're going to go down that route, it probably needs to be in an inpatient setting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's it, really. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. First of all, thanks for that. That was an amazing talk and really, really interesting. Lots of food for thought. Mm. Um, it's okay if I ask two questions. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So first of all, uh, I've got skin in the game. I'm a clinical pharmacist with an interest in like mental health therapeutics and stuff. And I know that antipsychotics can have some extremely debilitating side effects yeah. and some very long term kind of like uh, metabolic. So they really destroy your kind of like metabolism and stuff and they can make you die younger. We know that. But so that's schizophrenia, apparently, kind of like there's a lot of reason how it actually is really bad health outcomes. And there might be, you know, incorrect, so I'm happy to be correct in that. So if antipsychotics, with all the problems they've got, can still help those people kind of like potentially live some with some quality of life with all the caveats in there, is it really like a total, you know, no, no, we should actually really try to phase them out, knowing that they're overprescribed and all of that. Mm -hmm. And my second question, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you're aware, kind of like back in the golden age of um, uh, psychedelics in the 60s, 70s, I can't remember exactly when, there was a really small study done in an inpatient uh, children's unit with children who had like really kind of like really bad, um, I think it was schizophrenia, but probably kind of like just um, sort of like a persistent psychosis who were like self-harming, they couldn't, they were really kind of like kept sort of like, um, you know, physically restrained if I remember correctly. And they did, they gave them heroic doses of LSD okay. and uh, with therapy and mm -hmm. apparently, they had a very like, almost universal like wow. uh, cure rate, wow. and um, obviously no control, so it wouldn't pass yeah, yeah, yeah. for like, whatever you know. I guess a clinical trial. So, do you do you recommend it would be feasible to even try something like that in today's like landscape, mm -hmm. research landscape? Because obviously there are like lots of ooh, scary things in there. How how would you see this happening That's today? Would there be a way of? revisiting this? So, come back to your first question. I mean, I didn't talk about that. I mean, that's the, um, I'm not saying they don't have any place, but actually, yeah, the horror of the side effects of antipsychotics is just like, um, yeah, you can get Parkinsonism, so you're, you know, Parkinson's is too little dopamine, so you can get Parkinsonism, you get weight gain, diabetes, um, you get tardive dyskinesia, which is that awful movement disorder, which is irreversible on stopping it. Um, the whole idea of just blocking your dopamine anyway, massively. It's like dopamine is what, you know, we get, you know, when we achieve things, we get this dopamine rise, don't we? So mm -hmm. people be blocked with dopamine. No wonder they're chain smoking, just trying to break through that dopamine blockade. Um, but saying all that, certainly in the short term, I can certainly see it. And yeah, I can think, you're right. I think sort of, I can think of people with a low dose, long term, I know people that's helped, the guy, a friend of mine, he, he talks about his um, psychic sensitivity. So he says, I don't know if it's schizophrenia, but I see it as I'm psychic sensitive. And, but I can't exist in that world, so I have a small dose of risperidone, and that just manage me, manages me fine, if you see what I mean. But yeah, so maybe I was completely, completely dismissed them. Um, it's just, yeah, the massive overuse of them and, and reliance on them, and the idea that sort of get someone through an acute episode and then try and tail it off, ideally, which hasn't been, you know, because once you've been on that, because I've got unstuck a few times, if someone's on to cut it for 10 years and then you start trying to reduce them, it's it's really hard, actually. Yeah. Um, so there is, yeah, there is some place. What have you already said about that, about the morbidity of the physical health conditions of schizophrenia regardless of medication? Are you saying that or not? I think so, yeah, but it was an old study that there is. It's a myth. No, well, it's a myth. I think it's a myth, but I think it's... I remember hearing this thing that was, oh, there's a genetic link with diabetes and schizophrenia. So it's not really like drugs that's giving them diabetes, but yeah, I don't. I think it's more about kind of like someone who's like in a 
acute you know, chronic psychosis, they tend to kind of like go a bit off in how they, you know, take care of themselves and stuff. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, so poor self-care and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and your other thing, yeah, I mean, I think there is certainly, potentially, I don't know about that, I'd be interested to, if you can find that reference for me, it's really interesting what you could find, but the, uh, I, as I was saying just now, I do think, when you see people with severe psychosis who are really stuck, it's just like awful. And actually, I don't think, you know, I think the psychedelic, you know, we're giving them all these awful drugs which cause them some harm. So trial of a, a psychedelic, I don't think is, you know, <laughs> the, yeah, the, the, the small bits of evidence we have suggest it's not going to make things worse. It may, it may help people. But actually, sorry, sorry to sorry, Prof was doing it, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. So, um, yeah, how are we going to do it in this other landscape? I, I can't imagine all the clinical trials are saying they don't want, you know, once the drugs, once the drug is a license, maybe I can imagine, but yeah. Hi, Irene. Was it Mark? Yeah. yeah. It was fascinating talk and really culturally aware, like from the mental shock, from the the metal shackles of the 19th century to the dopamine shackles now the, the, these antipsychotics and you know like the fact that shamans were diagnosed with schizophrenia by anthropologists and now we're looking at like people hearing voices as being you say in in in, in different parts of the world as actually being a kind of in different cultures interpreted not as psychosis but as a beneficial or even a helpful thing i'm just wondering kind of like jumping off Achilles's point what so so there's this taboo right you can't mix psychedelics and psychosis how do you uh propose like the uh in in the highly bureaucratized and standardized clinical trial environment of today how do you propose breaking that taboo uh you know do you do you, do you look do you do you say do a kind of a you could do a physiological comparison. This is what antipsychotics do to the whole body. It's really horrible. This is what psychedelics do to the whole body. It's fairly harmless. Why don't Why don't we just? I don't think. I don't think. As I said, like, I don't think. And, and, and with all the, you know, and have like a, a caring network. Yeah, I, agree, I, agree. Yeah. I think. I think. I think pragmatically, it's not going to happen until those drugs are licensed. I think once those drugs are licensed. Mm. Um, at the moment, I don't think any researchers would, would yeah, be an absolute no-no. But once those drugs are licensed, then I think maybe you could start mm -hmm. looking at that, trying trials. Yeah, Because I was told that, you know, for example, like the only reason ketamine isn't given to over 12s in hospitals is because kids are allowed, you know, you, you, could, you, could, you could say, oh, you know, a child is allowed to go off into their okay. idea scape, into their like mm -hmm. realm of the imaginal but an adult no, you know, it could be, be quite unsettling for a doctor to hear but you know like what, what a doctor i heard i spoke to recent recently yeah. her, her only drug experience has had been with ketamine in in africa and she she had a really long conversation with her dead mother mm -hmm. and then when she came back she got a little bit feisty with the doctors because she wanted to keep talking to her dead mother kind of thing well, i was joking psychiatrists to all but with kids that's fine yeah and then with so that's that's kind of like almost the opposite of what, what you were saying right so like if you want the drugs you're not allowed them and if you don't want them you have to have them <laughs> 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 all right, so, uh, yeah thank you very much for the talk I mean, it's a very interesting relationship and um so a paper came out just about last month looking at these associations between psychedelics and psychotic symptoms. And they also looked at it uh, in relation to bipolar symptoms. Yeah. So they find... that, was, that was the one I mentioned, was it? Just last month, Honkett, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I guess their argument that uh, the way that they explain the data that a history of a psychotic uh, disorder uh, actually decreased symptoms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, while the bipolar um, increased that. So how do you understand these differences? So their argument being that uh, while psychedelic it. use attenuates the risk of psychosis in individuals with a personal or family history of psychotic disorders, it increases the risk of mania with psychotic features yeah. in individuals with personal family history. So where is the line? How do you kind of differentiate the two? Your between psychosis and mania, or between why it's why psychotic features and just psychosis. Okay. Well, yeah, because yeah, I mean, people can have a 
Pink Cloud are a one-off psychotic episode with some elevated grandiosity, isn't it? But mania is, if someone's got diagnosis of bipolar affective disorder, manic depression, so you get in recurrent episodes of mania, so mania depression, these elevated moods, okay? And they talk about the, the, the hypothesizing that it's causing switching because someone who has bipolar given an antidepressant can, can precipitate mania, so to me. So that's what they're wondering what's happened, particularly with MDMA. I see, definitely think that with MDMA and mania. I've seen that two or three times. I'm sure that it's the MDMA that is, if your mood is, you know, going high, and if you're highish in mood anyway, and put MDMA in the mix, if you see what I mean, that can make you too high. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Why psilocybin? I mean, I, I don't, you know, I'm not sure why. They, they, they postulate that psilocybin may be doing the same in that, switching people into into mania but yeah mm. Mm. and in terms of the psychotic features within the mania yeah like how how is that different to psychosis oh is that over is that your question okay mm. um yeah so basically yeah so you can have a mania without psychosis you can have a very elevated mood okay but then if you start sort of becoming sort of you know it, Classically, they'll be quite grandiose psychotic delusions. So you believe that you are on some special mission or something like that. You have special powers or mm. you've got this massive clarity of thought. You see what I mean? So they're described as mon mood congruent psychotic symptoms. Does that yeah. make sense? Mm. So yeah, you can still get voice, you get voice hearing and you get, yeah, the whole gambit so of the psychosis. I think that the problem isn't psychosis, but it can actually help psychosis unless there is it's that associated that mania. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was interesting. John Anderson's example, his own case is very interesting. But yeah, that's a case of one. But yeah, that's been the... Just to follow up on another quick question. Uh, is mania uh, an emotional thing or uh, is it just an affective thing? You said the mood. So just trying to understand what mania is, basically, technically yeah. speaking. Yeah, but well, in sort of psychiatric terms, you have sort of elevated moods. There's two elevated moods. You get hypomania, slightly raised. No. And mania, there's nothing that's high, you don't go higher than that, but yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's a description of an uh, elevated mood state. So, mania would be increased energy, less sleep, increased sex drive, some grandiosity. It's a bit of hypomania with someone in a good, really good mood at a party or something, or just done some cocaine or something. Do you know what I mean? That's sort of hypomania. Yeah, sort of it's thing. always a positive. Always positive, not necessarily. It can crash in the end, can't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is the switch to depression? Is well, there is the idea, yeah, switch to depression. But yeah, that could be. I mean, I don't. I don't hold this biological thinking about bi bipolar. Is often talked about in a very biological way, but actually, there's often um, early loss and trauma in people. Get that? So there's an the idea of a sort of manic defense. We seem to go manic after a bereavement. It's like sort of you know, it's a way of escaping. Um, the way I, the way I see it is that we've all got different we've got different sensitivities, haven't we? Some people may have that sensitivity with the trauma. To develop that, but I don't see it as this massive biological thing, bipolar either. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. What was the question? Oh, I can see them here. Uh, this as So that's the first question, what's it? Intrigue mentioned psychotic, you know, who are concerned the use of psychedelics. Is that generally in psychiatry for people with psychosis? Either way, do they think this? I presume it's linking it to your personal understanding of what matters can do. Um, you know, what, what people with other mental health problems, are they worried about psychedelics? Not necessarily, I don't think. And I mean, I don't, yeah. I mean, I'm just talking about those those people um, at that conference. That those people, those people that I know that talked about um, being very concerned about the idea of psychedelics. I think because their psychosis had been so awful, it's the last thing they wanted to do was go back there again, and they were worried that um, psychedelics could precipitate that, rightly or wrongly. Um, yeah. In in psychiatry in general, I think there's this like. Um, a lot of psychiatrists working, especially working in forensic services, they blame, it's very easy to blame things on the drugs. So you've got someone who's massively traumatized, and then they become psychotic, and actually they might have smoked a bit of weed or done a bit of acid, and they just blame it on that or something. And there's also this whole thing about that um, 
the age when psychosis happens is at that transition age, isn't it? Sort of late teens, early 20s, the same time as people are experimenting with drugs. So you get this, so people come into hospital and it's like, oh, it's meant to be a weed, it must be that. But actually there is, you know, there's this, they get associated wrongly in that saying often. That's not really answering that question. <laughs> What's it? Do you regard psychosis an inflammatory hot condition? Okay. Yeah, there is that interesting idea, isn't there? That's been talked about for a long time, this idea about whether there is uh, an abnormal inflammatory response which predisposes you to, to psychosis, if you see what I mean. And that fits in with the idea of taking large amounts of fish oils as well. And in our, in our diet, we would have had more sort of uh, essential fatty acids and stuff like that, which have an anti-inflammatory response. They work on the prostaglandin system. So, yeah. So there is the idea that sometimes it's sort of actually a disease of civilization, the more sort of where your diet goes. But yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I'd be interested to look more there. Yeah, there is talk about that. Um, I see it much more trauma, more, more than anything else. I see it as, tra as trauma is the important thing. I think, you know, 90%, 95%, there may be a bit of, of susceptibility there. Um, Question, when you mentioned using antipsychotic short-term rather than long-term, how long is short-term? A um, few weeks, a month, maybe longer, two or three months, but yeah. Um, <laughs> there. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah, there's just a question regarding the ketamine. So in terms of children, we do give ketamine to under 12s. Uh, mm -hmm. So like, you know, regularly we've given like intranasally, like six milligrams, you know, to under 66 year olds when we're reducing fractures. Yeah, yeah, for, for anesthetic, right? Yeah, yeah. Whereas not, not for adults. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah, no, we don't use as much for adults. We've got, we've got other agents. But, um, but yeah, we regularly use it for like MRIs and stuff with children. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like mm -hmm. psychosis induced by kind of like uh, psychedelics, is there anything in the literature about like how long it kind of goes on for, and if there is a pattern there specifically? And HPPD, you mean? Mm -hmm. I have a persistent hallucinatory disorder. Sort of like the eye movement type stuff, right? Well, I was talking like in terms of truth full on psychosis, where, for example, you know, your your friend that you mentioned in Wales, Mary, yeah. for example, uh, she had you know, a few days to work through it because, again, from my interactions with some groups, is like you know, people have had drug induced psychosis. From psychedelics but then within eight to 24 hours of them having ingested it they don't snap back after they have some sort of grounding back yeah it's sometimes like 48 hours is quite uh, not in the in the sort of normal parameters is it but sometimes it can be longer than that yeah sure so that's, that's what i'm trying to say in terms of like you know are we using in terms of the word the way we're using psychosis is that kind of you know psychosis has come on or, or onset wise nothing to do with drugs and that can almost come more full-blown psychosis where it might last for a longer period of time versus specifically psychedelic induced psychosis if that makes sense um not quite sure sorry <laughs> sorry um just kind of like i'm like well i think it can generally tr trigger it's much more on a sort of yeah short still like yeah an acute transit psychotic episode yeah, yeah it's, it's more like an yeah, acute thing i think if it gets managed badly it can become more chronic isn't it yeah again if someone if, if not if managed badly or or that, that was really interesting that guy that me and chris worked with that sort of you know just took a long time to come out in the end it was like several months that was yeah. that sort of paranoid persisted so it was that initially after his initial kind of like high enough the medication had run out it was just again the paranoia had persisted from that period of the mushrooms yeah yeah, yeah. So can I back behind you, Mark? Um, yeah, really, really interesting conversation. Thank you for bringing all this here. Um, I'm going to just take it in a little bit more, maybe of a light-hearted spin as well, um, but just a small moment, if that's all right. There's two things. Um, firstly, when you've mentioned about maybe this isn't great for the creatives, or it's not, you didn't say not great, but there was a, a nod to maybe that certain creatives or certain psychonauts were maybe going to go to psychonautical in it and then it kind of struck me as to what's your take on who this is really all for is one question in a way in a very light-hearted way because you've mentioned a couple lot of ground with a lot of spectrum of individuals that mm -hmm. kind of what i'm seeing as a funnel into I guess is trauma and obviously that's an important aspect but who really with what trauma is this going to be maybe necessarily most beneficial for if these 
aspects and maybe going to go too extreme. Um, it's a very light hard one, but the, the main really thing I was going to ask you, uh, there's many questions that I'd love to ask you that I haven't got all day, is um, in terms of the set and setting, I'm curious as to um, whether you're hearing or have heard of anyone talking about that in a more compassionate way, even in terms of exploring the set and setting is, is not necessarily on the patient itself, but maybe more on the facilitator or the person who is hosting that person to go through the experience about their set and setting being used within all of this kind of more research or in a psychiatric at least setting. I mean, set and setting is very important. Sorry, the you mean so, in clinical trials? You mean sorry about the set and setting? Yeah, in the clinical trials. How much emphasis is there on the set and setting of oh, the mean. actual? Um, facilitators in those mm -hmm. rather than the actual um, and wondering who's talking about that and if there is anyone could, could yeah no no I think there is I think there is I mean yeah. we, we've done that the compass training me and Owen haven't we the, the therapy training for that and there's a lot of talk about yeah the, the, the person the, the, the being the, the, the person who's facilitating being in a good set and setting themselves good in emotional state themselves understanding if someone's coming through and they're going to be your in clearly and what we've already explored uh, what i've heard at least uh maybe the set is not the best time for that individual but they're kind of maybe going to get a lot of benefit from it potentially mm -hmm. and in certain groups you're noticing that actually there has been some really great benefit for certain people but in a controlled setting it's kind of hard to replicate that model however yeah there's something to that and, and maybe it kind of speaks to a little bit of um the open dialogue, maybe taking yeah. that metaphor in an extreme of, if these studies are working, do we need control models anyway, if we can openly dialogue about the ones that do work and why is it they working? And is it something about the more compassionate pieces, not necessarily of the patient going through, say patient, you know, the person going through uh, the experience, but more about the, the setting of that individual who they're with and being sat with mm. i don't know it's kind of more stimulating thoughts for thoughts than it really i guess anything but i was curious about who if there are any names of people that you know of who are talking about that in the research settings yeah, research saying about the i mean i do <clears throat> there's quite a lot of tension to, i mean my own experience was yeah i do worry about that sometimes about the sort of quality of facilitators if you see what i mean and like and the and the and the training that they have and experiences. I mean, they may be great people, but it's actually um, if you're not sort of used to those realms, stuff come up you're not used to. I mean, if you think of um, but an analogy. I think a friend Russ, Russell Zach was a psychiatrist. He was setting up these, he was doing these like mindfulness retreats, and like he was doing that for a bit. He realised, God, I can't do this. It's just so he had to get his like. Diazan, a sort of, uh, to, you know, a Zen Buddhist monk who had taught him, because he realised it was like, he thought he knew stuff about mindfulness, but actually there was all this stuff coming up that he, he wasn't, you know, wasn't capable to, to, to yeah. So, so I do worry about that, you know what I mean? It's like, you may feel quite competent in being a facilitator, but then if you're not used to those realms and there's stuff coming up that, yeah, don't know how to, <laughs> what to deal with. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it sort of feels like early days though like, yeah, yeah. like the, as a facilitator you're like you are the setting you're like the most important part of the setting mm. and um and then most of the conversations and training that happen around set and setting are kind of quite crude they're yeah. just like you know make the room look like this yeah you know be compassionate yeah, yeah. you know and be present trust, you know, trust, trust, you know. Trust. <laughs> go, with, go through but there's like there's, there are people doing training programs on like preparing yourself to be a psychotherapy facilitator mm. uh, you know, some, uh, was set, up, set one up in the netherlands okay um and it's purely about like who you are and how ready you are to do yeah. work and there's nothing about the practicalities of a session is just like you and what yeah. you bring into it yeah. like you sit, if you sit in a room with someone who's really anxious you can feel their anxiety yeah. and you know, psychedelics are like sort of global magnifiers and you're going to feel yeah. what your facilitator's feeling and um so yeah and it, with this client group you're people who are it's probably more more of an issue and more important andy um, I'm curious about cross-cultural approaches to yeah. psychosis. Yeah, yeah. And just to give one anecdote, I, I know a Southern African traditional healer, and this is a story he tells about a woman coming to him presenting with psychotic symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. And after a month or two of training with him, he said she was cured because yeah. the signs he read 
yeah. as as being um indicative that she should be a healer. Yeah. And yeah. she you know, the spirits wanted to possess her. Yeah. No, I, to um, I totally, totally are, agree. Are there any studies on this? Because uh, that's a data point of one. Which is, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, there was that, was it Ross McKay talking about this continuum of psychosis and shamanism in that paper? But um, no, I agree. And interesting, the thing about, the thing about, they talk about trauma. It's in, you know, it's, it's often trauma. But actually, they talk about that in shamanism as well. Actually, you need, the only way to heal your trauma is to become a shaman, isn't it? That sort of, it's, it's, it's a really, so there's a yeah important thing for that. I but suppose it, the, uh, the 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 flip side of that is that that was one of the ways in which the West denigrated shamanism when it first encountered yeah, yeah. it mm -hmm. by saying they're all just mad. It's ironic. Yeah. yeah. I was working with this woman who was sort of Muslim, and um, and they went and they went. Oh, we go on to what's the famous is the East Ham. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> But yeah, they went to see the, the, the imam anyway in 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 um oh, sorry mosque. That's the word I was looking for. The East Ham Mosque is really famous, big mosque, isn't it? Is it gym possession? He went, no, it's not gym possession. Go back and see your psychiatrist, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Um, me. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, in your experience, have you seen any? Patterns, commonalities, and the traumas that you noticed were probably were. say that again. Sorry, um, you said trauma is important in this yeah. relationship. In this, in this context, basically, it's one thing to go to a war zone and get yeah. shell shocked and get PTSD out of that. It is another thing to have trauma from your family. Have you seen any uh, patterns of like these uh, where these traumas come from that are kind of more important? In this no, I hear what you're saying. I mean, yes. I think working in mental health services, I think, yeah, especially early, those early childhood traumas and stuff like that, you know, particularly. They took, yeah. Um, and they sort of, yeah, because not everyone, like, so talk about late for life, not everyone gets traumatized by those big life events, do they? So, Peter, not everyone gets post traumatic stress disorder from being in a certain situation. But actually, the people who are more likely to get it probably had early life traumas as well, making them more, yeah, it's, it's early lifestyle. And actually, it's, it's invisible, isn't it? Especially if it's pre-verbal, so you've got no memory of it, and it's quite subtle as well. I think I thought before about this idea of sensitive creative types. I've seen some lovely families, really lovely families, whose, whose children have developed psychosis. Okay, and um, and I don't think there's any massive trouble. There may be, some, and you think, well, what's the difference in them and their brother? But there may be some slight difficulties and differences. Do you know what I mean? But there are, but yeah, there's that whole idea of, of that idea of coming back to sensitive traits. So, what am I trying to say? Sometimes it's really obvious. You see people with massive trauma. You see people coming from the prison service or something like that who have just like this incredible trauma and they're, they're psychotic and they get called, get labeled with schizophrenia. We think this mean, it's like, seems a bit meaningless, really. It's very obvious. Um, other people, other ends of the spectrum, see, and it's not, you, you, yeah, you can't see any clear trauma. As I said, that may be, yeah, there, there are some sensitive types out there. And that's maybe it's part of the human condition, I say. It's like um, Sebastian Fawkes would suggest that that is the price we pay for humanity, isn't it? Sort of, you know, for our sort of creativity and everything, the price we pay is that small payoff the, of psychosis, yeah. Sorry. So, more questions there. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. I mean, there was a lot of talk about CBD makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah, but the idea is that it does have antipsychotic effects, anti-anxiety, antipsychotic anti effects. And I've got a friend as well who swears by CBD oil for, for her son. Um, I don't know of any studies about it, but um, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, questions are encounters with being entities during psychedelics considered by mainstream therapists and think of the symptoms of psychosis or schizophrenia? Uh, um, mainstream therapists, yeah. I mean, I don't necessarily consider that. I think a lot of people, psychiatrists or um, a lot of psychiatrists or mainstream therapists, if you went to them talking about entities and stuff like that, and um, 
<laughs> I was in this. I remember this like, like in this person's notes once. It was like this, about this person being um, being being psychotic, and they said they said they took some mushrooms, which they believed to be magic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Thanks a lot. And um, thanks for clearing up all the myths about the teenage friend who wasn't a latent schizophrenic. Um, I, I saw the one from my own friendship group of the weekend, actually. He's doing great. You'll be okay. pleased to know he's a heavy goods vehicle driver. I um, wonder if you could clear up another possible myth slash trope, which is um, in the default mode network, mm. schizophrenia is at the sort of far other end from the more sort of rigid Okay. mindset. Okay. Do you do you have facts in your fingertips about no. this, and is it a thing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I don't actually know. Yeah, that's interesting. I'd be Good. interested because uh, in I because I, I missed the first half an hour. And but yeah. were you talking then about Stan Groff? Yeah, you know, seeing it as if yeah, if we give them the old fifteen hundred Uggs, then yeah, put them all, you know, right the way around. No, I didn't talk about that. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I hadn't heard psychosis discussed as like a process. Okay. And is it is that how it's how it's regarded in the clinical context? Not necessarily. That's the way I see it. I mean, I do see people stuck in that world. Do you know what I mean? As I say, you get in, as I talked about that World Health Organization study, so better better outcomes in the in the in the sort of developing world, but it's still talking about a third of people not necessarily recovering mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. But it doesn't necessarily you can have ongoing does that mean that you can't have good quality of life and stuff like that? You know what I mean? You probably don't think you need to be medicated, just to be, maybe, you know, I think you can still have a good quality of life. And the other thing about that world, I'm jumping actually, but that world organization study, that talks about antipsychotics, but there's other stuff going on. It's like sort of in the culture, you may not be the culture which has believes in has shamanism and spiritual healers. They may not actually think this person is uh, a shaman, but they're shaman like, if you see what I mean. That those people, you just feel to me, you can still be in that culture. That you can contribution. They're sadly like or they're shaman like. You just, yeah, they've got totally got a contribution. I don't know if you think, but you know, there are people who I'm not people are very frightened of, isn't it? And I really warn to people who have this sort of non-consensual reality, living in a non-consensual reality. And there's some really interesting things that people have to say, don't they? Bardi Lang was saying, if you, listen, if you listen for long enough, it makes sense, doesn't it? But, uh, it's, yeah, it's more charming in, in some people than, than others. Sorry, it's that. It is more charming than others. And, um, just about the, you know, the clinical context, I think what, like, you know, very secondhand, but what, what Stan Groff says in LSD psychotherapy is about, about giving schizophrenics large doses okay. every day, is, um, you, you know, these are people who've been in inpatients for yeah, 70 yeah. years. So you're trying to unravel some stuff. Yeah, yeah. It worked and we ask them every day, are you sure about yeah. are you sure about this? Yeah. <laughs> I'd be like to read them that more actually. Yeah. Thanks. Last question, I think. Last question. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Um I guess I want to ask you about your personal perspective on something by just okay. briefly saying a case from my personal life. Um a child, 12 years, yeah. he was playing with the Ouija board, yeah. talking to dead and stuff. From then, developing a long-lasting psychosis, being okay. diagnosed with schizophrenia. Wow. Some people would say, let's go to a psychiatrist. Other people would say, let's do an exor exorcism mm -hmm. on her because there is an entity being sucked onto her body. She kind of, the symptoms she was having in the psychosis was self-harming, harming others. These entities talking to her. I guess my question is how you view kind of this cause of this really thing. Yeah. Like, really yeah. I don't know what to say. Be honest. Because that may, may that may be a complete red herring if it was that. There may be other stuff going. There might have been other stuff going on, I guess. I don't know. Do you see what I mean? It may not be related to that, that experience. Um, yeah, talking about sort of possession, <laughs> spiritual possessions. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. The kind of the cause of developing the psychosis. Like there is a sp specific situation where the child. That's it to trigger it. Is, mm, yeah, exactly. Okay. Like, I don't know. You want to say on that, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I, was, I was just like comparing 
because like there are certain types of psychosis like in the rd lang case that seem to come from within so like i need to count to one million and when i've done that i'll be fine but for that, until that point i'm just going to whisper under my breath and people are going to think i'm psychotic or i need to paint the wall in my own shit and if when i've painted the wall in my own shit then i'll be fine and i'll be a renowned artist yeah, it was Kingsley yeah. Hall, wasn't it What's yeah, exactly, yeah. Right so those are like interesting cases they, that seems to come from within but then there are these cases where yeah. there's some kind of external agency yeah. imposing itself upon you and i think that it would be quite interesting and perhaps richer to look at psychosis you know in, in those kind of grades of like agency you know yeah. um yeah, just, yeah, because so like broad. yeah so um yeah i guess yeah but i think that's a really important question because i've i've seen in recreational and ceremonial contexts mm. possession mm. and i've and and i've also seen people being you know almost possessed by themselves mm -hmm. yeah really they have to get this thing have to get to the bottom of it mm -hmm. even if it has no bottom you know <laughs> so yeah um so i think that that's an interesting distinction there when there's like when it feels like there's an external agency imposing itself mm -hmm. upon you mm -hmm. or whether you are compelled or you have a compulsion yourself there's certainly for people to describe this sort of there's a loss of boundary of self don't they and feeling controlled by outside yeah, whereas, whereas in the psychedelic experience, that loss of self is actually, you know, not perceived as a losing control of yourself, but actually in psychosis, it can be perceived as this sort of, yeah, you've lost losing control of yourself. Mm -hmm. Whether it's an actual entity doing it, I mean, I don't know. But that is also a feature of trauma, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Right, are we finishing that? Sorry, did you want to ask one question? Oh, it's a simple comment. If it is about just uh, a perceived subjective experience and uh, that is problematic that we need to basically address and it's about the methods of doing that but i see no problem in just going both ways yeah yeah, yeah. uh if it if in the end what is important is about the, what uh, works yeah, you don't have to have ontological yeah. commitments to what works because in the like that idea. in the open dialogue model that i talked about earlier on because the idea is like i'm not the expert you're the expert in your own healing so you're actually just creating a space so you just actually talk it through and you'll have sort of other family members there and everything that knows that person so you just yeah i'm not there you're the expert in your own healing i'm not do you see what i mean you're just trying to so i haven't got these clever answers sometimes so it's just so i think it's just listening and yeah going with what comes up sometimes okay Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.